in our future class this morning, there was talk of, of um, basically being an island to yourself, I guess would be one way of saying it, but you're responsible for your practice. Uh, and I can't blame on anybody else. I'm reading a, a book on Korean Zen right now. Uh, it was written by one of the late masters. He passed away. can't think of his name. But that's just age. Not his age, my age. And uh, Kusan Sinem. And what's his name? Kusan said, so when you're old, all you have to do is wait. You know, age is about patience. Isn't that right? It's about patience. Just because you can't remember what you wanted to, to say, all you have to do is just take a breath and, and relax, and it'll come to you. Maybe the next day, nobody's around to hear what you have to say, but it'll eventually come to you. In the West, where we live, there are two forms of meditation that are commonly practiced. And uh, they're, they're both from Japan. And uh, just to give a little background like I usually do, there are actually uh, in Japan, three forms of meditation. But one of them finally got some proper recognition. And the form that the great Master Dogen brought back from China uh, was the Kaldong School, which uh, the Japanese called the Soto School. And their practice is to sit quietly, basically doing nothing. And then there's the Lin Chi School, which in the Japan is called the Rinzai School. And when I was young, I worried about things like, how does Rinzai translate, in, or I mean, how does Lin Chi translate into Rinzai? How did they pull that off? And I still don't know, but I don't care anymore. <laughs> That's the only difference. And those were the two predominant schools. And then as time went by, uh, in China, there was a, there was a, uh, a popular school that formed up. Now, I, I, every time I do this, I have to go, okay, ah, let's go back a little bit historically. Historically in China, there were 13 different schools of Buddhism. 13 different ways of looking at things. And some of the ways they were looking at them were not radically different. It wasn't like, oh, gosh, gee whiz, that's even Buddhism? No. It was just kind of different ways of looking at them, like there was the Vatantaka school. And uh, it was all formed around this one sutra. And there was the Lotus Sutra school, uh, which uh, eventually became what we would call the Pure Land school. And it's centered around uh, the recitation of the Buddha's name. Now, they use that as a meditation. They're not a Zen school. They are the Pure Land school. And, uh, but this grew up in China. Well, just after the year 800, about 800, it, it, scholars, you know scholars, Oh, no, it was 832. No, it was 834. No, it was 831. 
you know, and they argue about stuff that doesn't matter. And the reality is, uh, sometimes there's two or three dates, just some, somebody wrote it down wrong, maybe. Uh, my original source on this was around 834, there was a purge of Buddhism in China. Another author that I recently read called it 840. You know, it was around that time. And what was going on in Buddhism at the time was they had these 13 different schools, the Yogacara school, they had the Venia school, they had uh, the Lotus school, they had the Avatamsaka school, and all these different schools. And mostly, mostly it was the philosoph philosophy of the school that was slightly different. It wasn't the Buddhism. They all believed in the Buddha. They all were aware of the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path. You have to come to America, actually, to run into people that are not familiar with those two basic concepts, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Most people who practice Buddhism in America, I've been told by my informants, have no idea what you're talking about if you talk about the Four Noble Truths. They, they don't get it because to them Buddhism is sitting on a round cushion until your back aches and your knees are killing you and now you are starting to accomplish the practice of Zen. You are physically miserable, therefore you must really be doing Zen. And after a few years of that, it eases up, eases up. My Zumi Roshi used to say, if the retreat is long enough, everybody is physically uncomfortable. <laughs> so here we are in China in the ninth century and we've got a problem. Too many people are monks. And they've got to fix the problem because that was during a period of time when there were three Chinas and they were arguing with each other all the time. Each, each one of those Chinas felt that they should be the China. You can see that this argument is still going on. Uh, we, we have some stuff going over there. Uh, you know, Russia is attacking a country that used to be part of the USSR, but the USSR doesn't exist anymore. But uh, Mr. Putin is not happy about that. Therefore, he's going to see if he can reconstruct heaven. Because the U when the USSR existed, they were a power, a power to be reckoned with. And Mr. Putin, I think if we could say anything about him without knowing him personally, we could say he's macho man. And uh, I keep thinking of the picture that they published of him bareback. He was bareback, riding on a horse without a shirt on, being very, very masculine. And I could smell the musk coming off of the picture of Mr. Putin riding this horse. And it told me an awful lot about who he was. Follow me. I am male. I am the man. Well, back in that time we had three countries, or three kingdoms, maybe kingdoms, a better word. And we had three emperors of China. And, uh, you know, China's a really big place. It's even bigger than California. And there are countries in Europe that California is so much bigger than, you wonder why they even call them home countries, um, but they fought with each other constantly because this, this emperor had a warlord who was going to go and conquer this kingdom and therefore his kingdom would be twice as big. Now as far as I know, 
they did not, they, they never fought a war where all three were fighting with each other with the idea that they'd end up with one. These two would fight, then these two would fight, then these two would fight, then they would do that. Well, in order to fight, you have to have soldiers. And so they had the draft. And I always chuckle because uh, sometimes you hear people talking about when we used to have the draft. We haven't had the draft in a long time. After the Vietnam War, the draft basically was stopped. It was suspended. It didn't exist. We had the draft when we had the Civil War. We had the draft when we had the, the uh, Korean War. We did not have the draft when we had the Revolutionary War. Yes, wars have been going on forever, but we now have everybody that's in the military is a volunteer. And uh, that wouldn't have done too good in China because they'd have never had a war at all. Who wants to volunteer to go out and get killed so that the emperor can have a bigger kingdom? Well, nobody. So they had a draft. And they had taxes. And here was a funny thing. Monks didn't have to pay taxes. Now if you were a novice monk, if you were a brand new guy, just, just got your hair cut, and uh, you were really serious about becoming a fully ordained monk, you, you're required to wait a minimum of two years before you can do that. And during that period of time, you have to pay taxes in China. And after that time, then you would have a big fancy ceremony and you would be ordained a fully ordained monk for the rest of your life. You didn't have to pay taxes. Now you have to understand, you didn't have any money anyway. So it, it, was, it was kind of a, a really weird situation. We're going to have monks pay taxes, but the monks don't have any money. Well, I guess novices, they hadn't been gone away from home that long, and maybe their mom and dad, or if they're lucky, they have a, a long-suffering wife who was so happy to get rid of them that they are willing to pay the taxes. But the fully ordained monks could not be conscripted into the army. Well, Buddhism, as it became more and more popular, there were less and less people to fight in the army. And when you're an emperor, and the whole point of being the emperor is to have the biggest kingdom, it, it, it causes some friction. So around 834 to 840, See, that's how you handle two dates. Or you just cheat and say, in the beginning of the ninth century, the emperors of China decided, okay, we've had enough of this. We're going to get rid of Buddhism. If we get rid of Buddhism, which is a foreign religion anyway, and you have to understand that the Confucius and the Taoists have been jealous of Buddhism from the time it got there. Because in China, in those days, you could not build a temple without the permission of the emperor. You couldn't just move to Lucerne Valley and start banging up buildings like we did and say, here we are. You had to have permission. Matter of fact, you had to have permission so much that it was usually the person that provided the money for building either a temple in the town or a monastery on the mountain was the emperor himself. And monks would go to the emperor and say, please, please, can we, can we build a monastery to train monks on top of Mount Wei? And the emperor would go, that's a pretty good idea. I like that, I create a lot of merit. And uh, so when I die, I won't come back as a cockroach or a, 
a mouse, I'll come back as a very important person. Okay. And somebody woke up one day and these emperors all had advisors, they all had uh, financial advisors like our emperors in America today, you know, like Mr. Trump. Or if we had everybody that acts like a Chinese emperor, sometimes he does. And uh, he has his financial advisors. But the guys that don't make so much noise, he makes a lot of noise. But the guys that are kind of quiet, but they still have a cabillion dollars, they have they have the financial advisors, and the financial advisors said to the three emperors, you know, if you get rid of these doggone monks, you'd have lots of people to put in your army. And not only that, you could tax them. Now, I know it sounds crazy, you're gonna grab, you're gonna, you're gonna, Take the robe off of the man, make him grow hair, tell him to go get a wife. Then you're going to draft him in the army, you're going to pay him as low as you can, and you're going to tax that money. Nobody's ever done that before, have they? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. When I went to service, I made $67 a month. Wow, that was a lot of money. And do you know that they actually took taxes out of that? Yes, it's true. I kid you not. And so they said, let's get rid of the monks. Let's get rid of the Buddhist temples. They're a drain on the economy. And they went through and they kicked all the monks out of the temples and said, okay, they laicized them, which is a word you don't get to use very often because how often do you take a cleric or a clergy person and turn them into a lay person? And that's what they did. They took all the monks and they said, get out of the temple, go get, your, go get a job, and go get a wife, and uh, we'll be back to get you later on because our army's getting kind of small. They keep killing parts of our army, so we've got to build it back up. And so they kicked all the monks out of the temples, primarily in the cities. And not only did they do that, they burned the temples to the ground which is actually pretty smart because the monks could have snuck back into the temples, right? When nobody was looking. So they just burned all the temples to the ground. Well, the Chinese aren't any different than any other group of people, any other culture. They really didn't feel like spending three days climbing a mountain to go up to a monastery to tell 80 or 90 monks that they no longer could be monks and to, to get out and go get, you know, and we'll burn your monastery down. Oh my God, we got to carry all this and we got to burn them. No, we'll just leave them alone. And they left them alone. But the only, only monks that lived on the top of mountains that took two or three days to get up were Zen monks. And so we had this unique thing that took place. They got rid of all the monks except the Zen monks. So guess which school became the predominant school in China? The Zen school, the Chan school. And that lasted for a while because nothing ever stays the same. And then all of a sudden, here comes a bunch of monks and they're reciting the Lotus Sutra. And not only are they doing that, they're not really trained Zen monks, so they haven't had this, this tough guy training in meditation. What they've learned to do is they've learned to say the Buddha's name. Well, we all do that. Namo Yinafa. You know, it's the only Vietnamese that any American that goes to a Vietnamese temple knows, although I've met a couple. I've met a couple that um, actually could speak Vietnamese. Matter of fact, I had a friend that I played music with last week, which was a lot of fun. Had a couple friends came over and we played music. And this one friend is married to a Vietnamese lady, and I said to her, uh, do you have a program for learning Vietnamese that you recommend? 
because I read an article in a magazine about how it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still learn a foreign language. So I thought, I'd give it another try. I'll try again. And uh, his wife said, oh, we have so-and-so program, and we're not using it, we'll give it to you. And that's the right price for me. I like that. So I said, that's wonderful. Yes, let's do that. So as time went by, the pure, what we call the Pure Land School developed in China. And they recited the name of the Buddha, Namo Buddha, Namo Buddha, over and over and over and over again, Namo Shakyamuni Buddha, Namo Shakyamuni Buddha. And it kind of helps you focus. You know, it's thing. There, there was a wonderful children's story about a little train. Remember the little train? I think I can, 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 I think I can. I did it, 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 I did it. It was kind of like that. And so they were saying the name of the Buddha. Well, they thought that was pretty good practice because they said, well, look, if I'm saying name of the Buddha, I can't have any bad thought. Because one of the Eightfold Path is, is uh, uh, good thoughts, proper thoughts. And if I'm busy saying the name of the Buddha, it's kind of hard for me to have bad actions, right? They, they talk themselves into this. And if I say the name of the Buddha, maybe I can say that I'm being mindful, which actually they're not. Because if you're walking and you're saying the name of the Buddha, what should you be doing? You should be walking. Now if you're standing perfectly still, oh, like we do on our cushion, then you could recite the name of the Buddha and you could even call that mindfulness. I'm being mindful of the Buddha. It's kind of a stretch, just a little bit of a stretch. So that Pure Land School, they went along for a while and they said, we're missing something. And so they went over and they had a long conversation, had tea also, and those little cookies that they have, you know, in China. And uh, you get them when you go to the restaurant. Do you know that those don't exist in China? Yeah. You know that we had a monk here that went to China when they opened the mainland China. And he came back with a story about a lady that got upset because they had Chinese food and she didn't get a, a fortune cookie. And he had to try to explain to her that's an American thing. She wouldn't buy it. <laughs> but the, the, the two different kinds of monks got together and had a conversation. And when they got done, they came up with a different version of Pure Land Buddhism in China. And what they did was they sat on a little round cushion and they crossed their legs and they followed their breath, regulated their breathing, and then they thought to themselves here, Namo Shakyamuni Buddha, Namo Shakyamuni Buddha, Namo Shakyamuni And they repeated that over and over again. And as they repeated it, in their mind they saw a picture. People always wonder why we have a statue of the Buddha. And people that are not Buddhists think that we pray to a, to a piece of wood or a piece of stone or a piece of plaster. That's to remind us how to meditate. If you look at the Buddha in meditation posture, that's the posture for us to take. So as they're sitting there, and they got their eyeballs closed. They see the Buddha. Well, they're occupying their mouth and they're occupying their mind. And they're kind of occupying their body because they have to sit up straight. They can slump over all the time. And that became the Pure Land Buddhism of China. And when you hear people talk about the Zen of China, most of the time, that's actually what they're talking about. 
And it came to Japan, and uh, you know, I've been sitting here for the last, what is it, 15 minutes or even more, and trying, trying to remember the name of that school, and I can't remember the name of the school. They came to China, they came to Japan though, but they never became very popular. And Japan finally, finally in the last few decades, decided to recognize them as a separate school from the Renzai school. Because they, they kind of looked like they were Renzai. And, uh, yeah. Tendai? Tendai, yeah. Tendai? 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 Oh, no, 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 no. Tendai is a, oh, that's... Shingon? Uh, no, Shingon. No, not Shingon. That's, that's another school. They all, and they existed in China. When, in, in, the, in the ninth century, when they blew everybody out, Tendai was Tiendai. It almost was exact pronunciation. And that was after a sutra. And the Shingon was, the, was like the Tibetans do. No, I can't. Obaku. Obaku Zen. See, all you got to do is be patient and give your mind time to, to sort. But you got a big library up there that's going through. So Obaku, it, it, they, it, they have temples in Japan. They never quite caught on. But they're there, and it's a combination of reciting the name of the Buddha, or thinking the name of the Buddha, or visualizing the Buddha, and doing meditation. So, what we had when we're talking about, when we talk about Zen, let's talk about America. Uh, my, my appraisal of this is that Americans really like Zen. We put it in our dictionary, we say something's very Zen, and everybody goes, ah, yeah. What do they mean? Well, they mean it's, it's very simplistic, it, uh, but it, it goes right to the point. They, they, they see Japanese gardens. D.T. Uh, Suzuki would tell you that, uh, and I quote him, in that if you scratch the Japanese culture underneath it's Zen. So an awful lot of things that we think of as Japanese were heavily influenced by this thing of doing meditation, just sitting on the cushion doing meditation and the clarity, the beautiful rock gardens, the beautiful flower arrangements, the haiku, just the calligraphy, all of these things are expression that came out of the practice of Zen. And there's two forms there. One is the solve the problem of Zen, and the problem of the problem of Zen goes like this. The temple was divided into two different wings. And there was a west and an east wing, and I never can remember which is which. But one wing was the administrative wing, 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 wing. W-I-N-G, <laughs> little speech impediment going here. And that's where the cooks lived. And that's where the head cook lived, and that's where the abbot lived, and that's where the assistant abbot lived. And that's the administrative wing. And they also had a small temple. Now we're talking a monastery, Zen monastery. Within that Zen monastery there was a temple, and that was the head of chant lived there. And well, what, why chanting? Well, because that's what we do. So when somebody would die, we'd have a funeral ceremony and we'd chant the teachings of the Buddha. So they had a chant over there. And maybe some really old monks, like Fomen. <laughs> really old monks would live there. And every day they would go to the to the, the Buddha hall, which was not huge, but they would go there and they would hit the fish 
and they'd ring the bell and they would chant for an hour and then then they would go back to their room and they would take care of their arthritis and then in the afternoon after lunch then they would go back and they would And the monks on the other side of the temple, they were in the, in the meditation hall. They were young, young Zen monks practicing meditation. And you know, the kind of meditation they did, most Americans would run away screaming. I mean, the, the most difficult place I ever ran into was Maizumi Roshi's uh, Zen Center of Los Angeles because he did 45 minute periods with about 15 minutes of walking. And the temple that I lived at, we did half hour periods. You can imagine, I'm used to half hour periods, no problem. And then I go to visit my Zumi Roshi. 45 minutes, well the first one, okay, I made that one. And then there was a second one. And I thought, what the heck is going on here? What are these guys, masochists? And they used to have this thing, they had groups coming in from on Saturday from, and if you belonged to that temple, you could not go and do interviews with a master on Saturday. You had to wait till Sunday or Thursday or whenever because a group would come from San Diego and they had first dibs on going in and talking with a master. And if they didn't all get through in two periods, we got another 45 minute period of meditation. What are these guys, nuts? I, I crippled out of there. I didn't walk. I stumped out of there going, oh, well, that's one way to do it. And at that, in that particular temple, they did a practice known as koans, which in Chinese is kongon. And it simply means a public case. Well, you got monks down over, over here on this wing, and they're sitting in there, and they're you're kind of you're kind of doing these problems. They're doing these uh, uh, you know problems uh, like they had a cat, and they loved this cat. There was only one cat at the temple because people used to bring animals when they get old and leave them off at the temple because they couldn't kill them. But you know cats, you can't. You, you can't tell a cat, stay. The cat laughs at you all the way out the door, right? You can tell a dog to stay. You tell a cow, stay. The cow just goes, Mah. but a cat, cat just gets up and walks out. So the guys in the administrative wing considered the cat their cat. And the guys in the meditation wing, and by the way, let me tell you how they did it and the, the real tough guys did it. They did an hour of meditation without moving, period. An hour of walking, an hour of meditation. Then they got to go to the bathroom. And then they rushed back in and they did another hour of meditation and an hour of walking. Meditation. We're, we're not walking like, ah, look at the birdies. No, we're in there walking around this little room, not making any noise, being very mindful of our walking, practicing really mindfulness. And One day, they got in an argument. The meditation monk said, the cat is ours. The administrative monk said, Fluffy is ours. The meditation monk said, the cat's name is not Fluffy. The cat's name is Wang Su. The administration monk said, I'll Wang Su you right in the nose. That is our cat. They got to the point where they were just about ready to have a brawl. 
And lo and behold, here comes the abbot. And the abbot was named Matsu. Very, very famous abbot. Matsu means mother. And Matsu said, what are you guys doing? And the administrator said, do we work all day? We keep the books, we do this, we have to go buy this food, and we do these things, and we work so hard, and that's our cap. And he looked at the meditation monks, and they said, we get up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and we do three hours of meditation, and then we get to go to the bathroom, and we can't go before that, and it's really rough, and our life is just a really tough life, and that cat, Wang Su, is ours. And the abbot really didn't know what to do. So he went to the kitchen, and he got a big knife. And he came back, and he grabbed the cat by the scruff of the neck, and said, okay, If you can tell me who this cat truly belongs to and agree upon it, I'll let the cat live. But if you cannot agree on who this cat belongs to, I'm going to cut it in half. And they're still moaning and groaning. It's ours. It's ours. It's ours. Wow! and he cut the cat in half. His student was just as famous as, his, as him. His name was Chao Chu. In Japan they call him Joshu. And he had been on a trip to another temple to give lecture series. And he came back. And he went to his master, paid obeisance, bowed down to the master and said, I've returned. And the master said, I wish you were here. I wish you were here last week. What happened? He said, the West and the South argued. Could be the North and the East, you know, I never get those things right. The West and the South, they argued over the cat. He says, oh, I remember the cat. I used to scratch the cat's neck. Yes, well, there's no cat to scratch anymore. What happened? Well, I tried to get them to step outside of themselves. I tried to get them to experience their true nature, to understand the emptiness of the universe, to understand nobody owns a cat any more than they own their body. And Chao Chu said, oh. And the abbot said, what would you do? And Chao Chu took his shoe, which I have on, because I have a hard time walking now, so I leave him on. And Chao Chu took his shoe and put it on his head. We'll call that a shoe. <laughs> and walked away. Now I had a good friend that I trained with and he took a class in koans, which I think is hysterical, the idea to have a class in koans. And he came back and he said, well, I, I, I now know the answer to the koan. Well, where's, where's the problem, right? The problem is for the Renzai monk, why did Chao Chu put a shoe on his head? Why didn't he actually say to the abbot, if you'd have done this? Because it's already done. And no two situations are ever the same. So he put his shoe on his head. In China, in the ninth century, when you went to a funeral, you took off your shoes and put them on your head. And Chao Chu went back to his room, and Matsu said, if he'd have been here, the cat would be alive. 
if he'd have been here. It's all in my lacking. That's a Rinzai school. So now I've told you this story, and my friend who was a monk in training with me, he came back after going to his koan class and explained to me that he now understood the story of the cat, Chow Chu's cat. And I looked at him and laughed because he didn't understand it at all. He just knew the story. But he didn't really understand the very depths of what that meant. In China, they call it a kongan. In Japan, they call it a koan. And your teacher might give you a koan. We, we rarely give koans here. I only give koan to someone that begs for a koan for someone that cannot let go of themselves. No matter how hard they try, they just can't seem to let go. Then I give them a koan. So I rarely ever give koans. But that's a, that's a very famous koan. Very famous koan. And the question becomes, why did the master cut the cat in half? Or why did Chow Chu put the shoes on the head? Okay. And, and actually the shoes on the head is the best way to approach it. Because when they started using that as a Zen problem, everybody knew that if you put the shoes on the head, it was a funeral. So now, what's the point of the story? What's the solution to the problem? There isn't one. Huh? I don't think there is one. We're all lacking in something. Well, yeah. But how do you step beyond that? Okay? We can intellectually say, and it's only intellectually, it's not spiritual, we can say appropriate action for what took place. You've already done this, well then go ahead and do the appropriate action. But do you know that here? Knowing something here does not solve the problem. Do you ever have somebody tell you, you, you had a bad experience, and somebody says, well just relax, and you want to hit them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> sure, I'll just relax now. But if that person could express relax without telling you to relax, perhaps modeling it, it might help. Might help. So the school down in LA, and we don't we used to have a monk here that went there quite a while. And I'd always turn to him and ask him, how many? They have to solve uh, I'll round it up to 250. I think it's like 280. They have to solve 280 of these these problems before their old teacher will say, "Aha! So now you have Buddha mind." In the solo school, which was begun by two monks, and they took their names and combined them in China, and it's called the Kaodong School. But by the time it got over to Japan, it became the So To. Still two names, So To School, and they just sit. And they sit with an empty mind. They don't sit asleep. They don't sit reciting the Buddha's name. They sit every time a thought arises, they look the thought, just pass on. Because what we're trying to do here in the Soto School is connect with the universe. And people get tricked. If you sit that way long enough, if you do a koan long enough, you will enter samadhi. 
Samadhi is a state of a, a, a very pointed mind where you can concentrate only on what you want to concentrate. The Eightfold Path, for years I didn't know what Samadhi was. I literally didn't know the definition of Samadhi. I knew the Eightfold Path, you know, da, 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 da. And then one day in a lecture in Los Angeles at a four-day retreat, the monk running the meditation hall said, when your meditation is truly deep enough, you will experience samadhi. And I went, samadhi is meditation. Number seven in our Eightfold Path is mindfulness. And I said to the monks today, I said, mindfulness is not a meditation. We have people running around who have paid, some people have paid three or four thousand dollars to get a certificate that says they're mindfulness meditation teachers. There's no such thing as mindfulness meditation. There's mindfulness and there's meditation. In samadhi, you're not mindful. In samadhi, your mind combines with the universe. There is a separation. You feel it all the time. The guy that walks out into his farm field after a rain that destroys his cotton crop or his corn crop or whatever, looks at the sky and goes, God, why did you do this to me? He's mindful of what happened, but he hasn't got a clue what's going on in the universe because nobody did anything to him. It rained. Mm -hmm. Right? All of us know how rain happens. We're getting this, we're getting a cool summer this summer, they say. Wonderful. We're going to get lots of rain. We've gotten a lot. California's been a in a drought for years. We're getting rain. We know how that works. It is not a mystery. And there doesn't have to be a deity making it rain or not rain. Let's go beyond that. Let's become the rain. When we become the rain, then we start to understand rain. And this is samadhi. Samadhi is letting go of your idea of who you are and you disappear. And when you disappear, you experience the universe. And when you experience the universe, you experience suchness. And you are that far away from enlightenment. And the only reason we use the word enlightenment is when you stop meditating, it doesn't go away. If it goes away, you still haven't taken that last step. In the sutra we're reading right now, the Buddha is telling the monks, you're capable of judging your own attainment, right? Well, if you make that last little leap, you don't need me to tell you that you made it. Now, if you're, you've become conceited because of your practice, I might hit you with a stick just to make sure that you made that leap. Because only you know for sure that you've made that leap. And that's Soto Zen. Which as far as I can tell is the most popular Zen here. They've had the most missionaries. But Renzai is here. Renzai solved the problems. My God. 260, uh, I don't want to go. But I did do, I did do a few with, with Tianan. And then I'm reading on Korea, and I'm reading on this wonderful monk who passed away not that long ago, and what they do, and it's the Wadu. And, it's, and I, I know I'm saying the word wrong. I'll get letters and letters and postcards from people that practice Korean Zen saying, you're saying that word wrong. 
But anyway, that's what it looks like. I say all kinds of words wrong. And in that form of meditation, it's very, very simple. And I found out that most of my life I've been doing Korean meditation. Because people would come to me, you could come to me and you say, you know that cat thing? Could I solve that koan? I said, I'm pretty sure you could. And you say, no, 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 can I, can I work on that koan with you? Yes, you can. And you would come in and I'd say, and this is the way it's worked. You come in, you sit down, and you state your koan. The two wings of the temple were arguing over who owned the cat. The abbot cut it in half. When Joshua returned to the temple, he put his shoes on his head and walked away. Now I wait for your and if there's pause, a little drama, and then you give the answer. And you may go, yeah! And I go, pretty close. You've almost got it. Maybe next time when you come in, try a little harder. Push a little harder. In Wadu, in the Korean form, many of them only work one koan their whole practice. And they would take that koan and they would turn it into one idea. Why? I used to tell people all the time, this is, this is a paradox of what you say and what you do. If you came in, I'd say, okay, now you've got to, and you say, well, how do I work it? How do I work it? What do I do? What do I do? Okay, well, when you sit down in meditation, review that koan in your mind. Say it over again. Every time you sit down to do meditation, say it over again. And then, and then let go. You've got to let go. In the Korean Zen, they know the story. They just say, why? And as they sit in meditation, they go, why? And if their mind starts to wander, they come back to why. And if they think they know the answer, they ask it again, why? And they will solve the koan, and their master will say, good job, you solved the koan. And they'll go for a year, two years, four years, and one day they realize the depth of their understanding is not enough. Guess what they do? The same doggone koan again. They go back to it and think, okay, I missed something, so I'll start asking why. And they create doubt again. And we call it the great doubt. And the practice is in, you have to have the great doubt. And what are you doubting? You're doubting everything you think you know about the universe, which includes you. And when you doubt everything, you can let go of everything. And what's left? You. There you are again. And the master that I'm reading about, he had three experiences. The last one was a super, super duper great enlightenment. And his old master, who had one tooth left in his mouth, said, Good job. And that was it. No ice cream, no cake. Just good job. We're done.